is also out of respect for you that we have chosen very meaningful training that will be very applicable to our kind of training here. What you're going to hear today will fill your toolboxes for immediate use in the classroom. You can decide which pieces of what you hear today fit your style. And you may find that what you're already doing is a firm. So it may be a big pat on the back. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Whitney Rapp. Oh, it's working. Is that helping? Okay, I'm testing the microphone. Dr. Rapp is an Associate Professor of Inclusive Education at St. John Fisher College in Rochester, New York, where she teaches courses in inclusive education, pedagogy, assessment, classroom management, and diversity issues. Dr. Rapp holds a Bachelor of Arts in Elementary Education and Psychology from SUNY Potsdam and a Master of Arts and Doctorate in Special Education from Michigan State University. She is the author of Universal Design for Learning in Action, A Hundred Ways to Teach All Learners, and the co-author of the textbook, Teaching Everyone, An Introduction to Inclusive Education. Now by the title of those books, you have, should have some idea of what we're working on today. When I interviewed here, the reason I accepted the offer was because one of you asked me, what do you do when you have tried everything to reach that one student and you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're still trying to figure out what it is that it will take to reach that one student. Let's welcome Dr. Rapp. share a lot of what I'm doing in the classroom with all of you. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of extra background. Uh, my PhD is in special education with a focus on policy and law and school reform. So a lot of what I do is school-wide reform efforts to change the way we're educating kids. Most of my research and practice is in the K-12 uh, schools, and that's where I do a lot of my presenting, especially on universal design for learning. Uh, but the past couple years, I've done more and more at the college level, realizing that um, what's impacting our kids' learning through grade 12 is still impacting them as young adults through uh, their college years. So whatever we can do in the classroom to make sure we're reaching every learner, the more uh, folks, diverse types of learners, the more diverse folks we're going to put out in our given fields instead of the same type of um, uh, thinker and learner. Um, that goes out into each given field. So I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. Also, uh, I have three kids. Uh, my oldest just finished his freshman year in college in a studio art program at Nazareth College, and he has um, multiple neurologically based disabilities. And what that meant for him is that we had to figure out different ways for him to learn in the classroom. So we have a brilliant kid, I don't mind saying that, brag a little bit, a brilliant kid who um, very much found school a mismatch for him. So um, a lot of traditional classroom settings made it really difficult for him to learn. So we spent years thinking of different ways to introduce information to him so that he can grasp it and be able to demonstrate what he knows. And he's in college and he's doing great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, those disabilities too. All right. Um, so three things I want to cover for you today. And my plan is um, to go talk about different things till about 11 and there'll be plenty of time for question and answer for things that apply directly to your courses and programs. Uh, I'd like to provide an overview for you of Universal Design for Learning and its application to the college setting, so what that is exactly what it means. Um, and then an overview of neurologically based or hidden disabilities and uh, difficulties that you might be seeing in your classrooms when those are present and uh, then share some strategies for universally designed learning environments 
um, that are going to help prepare a more diverse group of people for success in their children. All right. I always start with a couple of foundational concepts so you know where I'm coming from ideologically, what my thinking is as I approach any type of teaching and learning situation. Uh, the first is um, it's really important for us to make a shift in our thinking, a paradigm shift, really start reconceptualizing how we view disability. So we need to make a shift from thinking, uh, thinking of disability as deficit to thinking in of disability as diversity. And what this means in the field I'm in, in the inclusive education field, is moving away from disability, the medical model of disability. What the medical model of disability tells us is that people with disabilities are sick or broken and they need to be fixed or cured. We don't like that. Um, what that says is that um, the problem lies within the individual and they need to be different than who they really are. Um, I believe fully that every learner is, um, is not broken, does not need to be fixed. They are the learner that they are and what's really happening is a mis mismatch with the environment that they're in. So if we move away from that medical model to a social model of disability, that views disability as a form of diversity that does not need to be fixed. The same way that race, gender, um, uh, language, ethnic background does not need to be fixed. It makes us who we are, and it's all important that we are diverse in our own way. Same with disability. So that's one of that's the foundation, one of the foundational concepts. The second is making a distinction between the letter of the law which is what we have to do in our classrooms to make sure that everything um, is accessible so no one is excluded. And so the letter, of us, uh, the letter of the law tells us the minimum that we have to do by law to make sure that nobody is excluded or, or barred from, from our classrooms and our college programs because of disability. And distinguish that from the spirit of the law, which goes beyond just the minimum. So not just not excluding, but really including everybody. And not just people with disabilities, people without disabilities, but everybody. So how do we do that? Um, I'm going to use uh, an example of physical access, because in the next part, I'm going to distinguish between two, con two um, concepts. That's the best word for it. Universal design of physical space, and then universal design for learning. They have almost the same title, but they are not exactly the same thing. So universal design for physical space means setting up the physical environment so everybody can physically move through it and access it. Um, and that is just the first part of what universal design for learning is. So it's, it confuses a lot of people, and those terms are used interchangeably because they, they're almost the same, but they really are two different things going on. So here's an example of universally designing just the physical space. If you have a student who uses a wheelchair, the letter of the law tells us that we have to um, put in a ramp anytime that there are stairs, uh, or an elevator to get to another floor. Uh, there have to be automatic doors, so those doors where you push a button and they swing open and they stay open for a minute and then they swing shut again. Uh, there has to be a wide aisle in, in a classroom that would lead to a desk or table space that is wheelchair accessible. And there has to be a, an accessible stall in the nearest bathroom and there has to be an accessible dorm room if the person who uses a wheelchair is going to live on campus. And that, so that's all the letter of the law. The minimum that you would have to do if you had a, a student who needed physical access. To your school setting. And then I've also known folks who are willing to give a late pass or not penalized for being late because a person with, in a wheelchair has uh, uh, limited mobility and it takes them longer to get from one classroom to another. Okay. So they're not going to uh, take any points away or deduct from their grade or anything if they're late. That's going to be okay. All right, so now um, that's the letter of law. Moving to the spirit of the law and what it would mean to actually universe to universally design our physical space so that everybody can use it exactly the same and be fully included. Um, going beyond that, um, this is what happens. So you have a person who uses a wheelchair or can't go up the stairs. 
letter of the law solution says to put in a ramp. So it's a separate um, but equal modification that you would do for the stairs. Okay. Universal design or spirit of the law thinks about designing everything from the get-go so everybody uses it together. It's not separate. Everything's all, everyone can use the same exact stairway to get where they're going. So the difference between separate but equal and inherently all equal everybody together. So that's the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. Thinking about everyone from the get-go rather than retrofitting. So what this ramp says is, well, we designed this space for most everybody and then we had to come up with something for you because the law tells us to. That sends a message that this space is for most people and then we thought about you as an afterthought and had to let you in because the law says. But that stairway that's designed for everybody sends the message that this space is for every learner right from the get-go, not some people and then. All right, so going back to that example of student in wheelchair. You want the spirit of the law universally designed school setting for, that includes everybody then you would have a step-free building. Ramps only. Not thinking about who can use stairs, who can't use stairs, where's the other entrance for folks. It would be a step-free building. More and more buildings are being built now without steps at all, and without even the need for elevators. So they're either all one floor, all flush with the ground, no steps to even enter the building, everything's on one floor, and if they did have a basement or a storage facility, there would be a ramp down there instead of stairways or an elevator. Um, automatic sliding doors, better than the swinging doors. They're wider, they malfunction less often, uh, they stay open longer, um, the sensors are better on them, and they're much easier for a person to use um, who has a wheelchair. Every single aisle in the classroom would be wide enough to accommodate a wheelchair, not just one pathway, but any pathway, and every single desk would be adjustable to however that student needs to use it. So now they have the same choice in where they sit as everybody else, rather than just one aisle that leads to one desk and they're always stuck sitting in the same place when everybody else gets to choose where they sit is not full inclusion. It's not the spirit of the law and it's not equitable. Um, all of the stalls in the bathroom would be accessible. That's universal design. You wouldn't have to worry about where the handicap accessible stall is and in which bathroom, which stall it was. Um, you wouldn't have to worry about waiting for the one that's accessible. Everybody would use any stall. Every dorm room would be wheelchair accessible. And instead of a late pass, don't start without anyone. So even though you weren't going to take points off if that person was late, if you start class even a couple minutes later if somebody came in, they're not privy to what happened in the classroom in those first two minutes, and everybody else in the class isn't privy to what they might have added to the discussion in the first two minutes. So if you start without anybody, your learning community is less for it because not everybody is present to add their knowledge to the group. So it's thinking about really valuing what everybody has to say, and that unless everybody's present, then that learning community is not whole. So that, that's the foundation that I teach with uh, in my own classrooms at the college level. And um, the, when I share strategies with folks, that's where I'm coming from. So not thinking about accommodate, accommodating after the fact, but everything that you can do ahead of time so that everybody can have full access right from the get-go. All right, so here's a comic that I use often. It's, I pulled it off the internet. It's for public use, but it really, really ties to exactly what I'm talking about today. So that whole universal design of physical space that I um, just mentioned, all fits into universal design for learning. When you universally design your learning, you're, you're designing physical space for its, so it's for everybody, but you're also designing instruction, um, the climate in the classroom, social emotional climate in the classroom, uh, attitudes, everything, your materials, how you schedule things, time limits, everything is designed right from the get-go so that everybody can be included. So it's physical plus, um, and that's the difference between those two things. So this comic with all those animals lined up in front of the teacher, and they all have their own strengths, and they all uh, have their own abilities, which are all great. So diverse, uh, disability as diversity, or ability as diversity. And then the teacher says, for a fair selection, everybody has to 
take the same exam. Please climb that tree. So there's really only one animal that's going to knock that out of the ballpark. Right? The monkey's going to be able to climb that tree, no problem. Um, the bird, the penguin, the elephant, the goldfish, the seal, and the dog, not so much. So what universal design for learning does is not focus so much on everybody taking the same exam, but thinking about what is the end point? What is my goal here? What do I really want? Do I want them to be able to climb, or do I want them 20 feet off the ground at the top of the tree? If being 20 feet off the ground is your end goal, how can you design things so that you can get everybody 20 feet off the ground? Maybe only one of them is going to climb the tree, and the rest of them are going to do it differently. But if you can figure out a way to get everybody 20 feet off the ground, then you have reached your end goal for everybody. And everybody was able to do it in their own way, in the same learning environment, without being excluded from the get-go. So on one hand, we might say, you know what, Penguin, you're just out. You're not built for this. There's no way you can do this. Just looking at you, I can tell. Or we could say, huh, how do you get a penguin 20 feet off the ground without climbing a tree? Anybody? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Somebody once said that the elephant can pick them up. Sure, cooperative learning. We'll, put them, we'll pair them together, the elephant can help for a while, but eventually we've got to unpair them so we can sure the penguin can do it by himself because he's not always going to have a buddy with him when he gets out there into the field working on his own. So you can start them out helping each other, but eventually we got to figure out. We can put a ramp in for the penguin, we can design a lift for the penguin, some sort of assistive technology. That's what my husband does for a living. He is the um, principal of uh, rack design. Um, which is just a small one-man operation, but he designs assistive technology for that, just that reason. I have somebody with a unique ability who wants to be able to do this. What can I design to get them from 20 feet or from the ground to 20 feet up? Um, so the bird can fly, looks a little bit different. He's not climbing the tree, but can almost as easily get to 20 feet up. Things like that. So you're thinking about it in different ways. All right. So I'm going to return to, uh, to um, an example from my son uh, Sam that I talked about. He has um, a learning disability called executive functioning disorder, um, which I'll expand on in a little bit. He has um, some sensory integration issues and um, seasonal affective disorder. Anybody heard of that? Yep. His neurology is actually impacted quite significantly by the lack of natural light. Rochester, New York, not the best place for him to live, but there it is. Um, and uh, when he saw this comic, he said, you know what, not for nothing, but I'm a dog. He said, I am cute, I am cuddly, I am loyal, but there is no way I'm climbing that tree. So if you could just let me be the do best dog I can be, I would really impress you. And he's impressed a lot of dogs. So, but he does things very differently. And he has learned what he can't do internally with his own brain. He has coping strategies that he uses externally that have helped him calm. It, you know, he's doing exactly what he wanted to do after high school. So, isn't that the goal? All right. So, a little background on UDL. Show me quick, um, fist to five, fist is a zero, all the way up to five, how much you know about UDL. So if you just heard about it two slides ago, that's a fist, and five is, you know so much about it, you could do this talk instead of me. Okay, lots of fists. All right. So here is the concept of universal design for learning. And honestly, it's a big phrase that basically means making sure that everybody can do everything you need them to do in the classroom all the time. Um, so there's three principles, and it's all based on brain research. And there's three things that have to be in place in order for everybody to be able to learn the way that they learn best in your classroom. You have to find lots of ways to engage them, multiple means of engagement, lots of ways to engage them. And it's not just catching their interest. It's not just getting engaging them in terms of, are you interested in what we're learning here? But how does your brain work so that you can keep going on this task and be able to focus your attention on this task until it's all the way done? That's what it means to engage the brain. Um, multiple means of representing new information. So lots of different ways to get that information across to them. 
And the more ways that you, more different ways that you have that a brain experiences the same information, the better. So if you just talk at people with no visuals, if it's just auditory, the brain will form a single neuron pathway for that information. And it's pretty weak. It's like, kind of like walking a tightrope. Uh, but if you have, if you explain it, plus you have slides or notes to go along with, plus you have them write something down, plus you give them a couple minutes to talk it out, now they've experienced the exact same information four different ways. They've created a neural network in their brain instead of just a single pathway. Now it's a nice strong net. And the more ways that you reinforce that net, the more able they're going to be to be able to access that information later and apply it effectively and, and accurately in the future. So lots of different ways to get that information over to them. And then the last one is uh, multiple means of action and expression. So uh, lots of different ways for them to show you what they know. So we have our paper and pencil tests. Can they take an oral exam? Can they demonstrate? Can they do both? and do a combination and make sure the skills are there either in writing and or in demonstration. Um, can they, instead of write a paper, can they do a poster or something that's a little more um, visual and spatial? Maybe they express themselves better through drawing and labeling <coughs> drawings than they would um, writing out a checklist of steps or something like that. So if you can accept different formats or different ways to get 20 feet off the ground, you will find that you're getting lots of fantastic ideas out of folks who have gone through school maybe with this idea that, you know what, I'm not a really strong book learner, so I don't think I can do this. And once they have an alternative or a choice of how to do it a little bit differently that matches their brain, then you start to see them taking risks and being more creative and using their information a little better. So those are the three original principles. And then my colleague and I, when we um, published our textbook in 2012, added assessment. And um, so we call these three engaging, engagement, input, output, and, assess and assessment. So you want all four of those pieces to be universally designed for folks. Because a lot of what happens in schools is we say, yeah, they can show us what they know all semester long, but at the end they still have to take that same standardized test. So and that happens in New York schools. All the standardized testing that's going on in New York State schools, we're doing the same thing. Teachers are saying, yeah, they can do oral reports and posters and projects, but they still have to take those standardized tests at the end. So that really kind of ruins that whole concept when you still have that same tree for everybody to climb at the end. So we want to get to a point where we're not confusing standards with standardizing and thinking of lots of different ways to get everybody up to that height. All right, so this is what the brain, this is how the brain works in the research that this is based on. The brain has three different networks. The recognition network, the strategic network, and the affective network. And those, those three things are going on in your brain all the time. The recognition network deals with what you are learning. Do I know what I am learning? Do I know what the content is? The strategic network is how. Do I know how to learn this? Do I know how I'm supposed to show that I've learned it? Do I know what to do with this stuff once I've got it? So what you're learning and how you're supposed to apply it. And then the affective network is why. Do I know why I'm learning this? Do I know why it's important? Do I know why I should be interested in this? So all three of those things have to be in place for learning to occur. If one of those is missing, what happens is the amygdala, which is in the base of your brain. The further back in your brain, the more reactive and um, instinctual your behavior is, and the more uh, forward in your brain that it occurs, the more analytical and, and synthesis, analysis and th synthesis, real thinking occurs. So the front of the brain is for real thinking, application, analysis, synthesis, evaluation. Um, the base of your brain is for your instincts, um, reactionary things. So if one of those networks doesn't have what it needs, then the amygdala, which takes in all of the information, all of your information goes into your brain through the amygdala. If one of those things is missing, the amygdala gets stressed. And when it's stressed, it will send everything to the flight or fight center of your brain. 
which means that it isn't sure what to do with the information, and it'll go in one ear and out the other. So if, some, if, they, if your students don't know what they're supposed to be learning, they don't know how you want them to, to use what they're learning, they don't know why they're learning it, then it's going to go in one ear and out the other, essentially. So if the amygdala is stressed, that's what happens. Now the kicker is that boredom is stressful on the amygdala. So whether it's freaking out or it's bored, it will react the same way and it will send information in one ear and out the other. If the amygdala is happy and comfy and it has everything that it needs, it will send that information to the prefrontal cortex instead. And that's where real learning and application occurs. So universal design for learning is all about making the amygdala happy. We want it to be comfy so it sends all the information that comes in to the prefrontal cortex so we can actually do something with it and remember it for later. Build those nets those neural networks so that we have a nice strong base for all of our information. So that's where these ideas, all these ideas are based. Okay. So what happens when we have students who struggle in the classroom? You've seen students who seem to get stuff really quick. They will remember it, they pick up on it, they apply it, they get it right the first time. They're naturals. And then there's other students who the, their determination is there. They really want to learn this. They, they came into their, their chosen field and they're in the programs with you and they really want to learn this, but you see them struggling. They have a hard time getting the information um, and remembering in a way that they can apply it appropriately when the time comes. Okay. So that second set of students, those are the mismatches. They are different, not deficit learners. They're different learners. And it's just going to take a little bit more to create a match in the environment for those folks. Some folks are very, very adaptable. You could throw them in any situation and they're like, okay, hang on, give me a second, gotta get my bearings, all right, I can figure out what to do here. And they can learn no matter what. That's a highly adaptable brain. A lot of brains need a little more um, help in the environment for them to be able to um, <coughs> match the situation and learn from it. Not deficit, different. So these are some mismatches that I work with a lot, um, that I see in college classrooms. And I'm a teacher educator, so all the folks that I teach are going to be teachers. And we've had instances, uh, we have um, students with autism in our program. We have students uh, with um, uh, atypical, unreliable speech in our program. We have um, students with hearing impairments, and visual impairments, um, other uh, sensory integration issues in our program, learning disabilities. So we could at one hand say, you know what, if, you're on, if you have autism, you can't be a teacher. You can't speak reliably, you can't be a teacher. Or we could say, what really is the end goal here? Is it to be a, do you have to be able to speak reliably to, to be a teacher? Or do you have to be able to communicate clearly to be a teacher? And we decided as a program that our end goal is you have to be able to communicate clearly to be a teacher. And there are lots of ways to communicate other than speaking. So we have students who use text-to-speech devices in their teaching, and they're doing just fine. So they type what they need, and the device speaks for them. So if, 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 if they type clearly what they need to tell the students, and the device tells the students, and it's an assistive technology that allows them to, reach, to be 20 feet off the ground in that tree without having climbed it in a traditional way. So that's one example. All right, so what I want to focus on is a little bit more of the hidden things. So you might have folks who um, have physical disabilities that are a little more obvious, but here I'm going to focus a little bit on what's hidden. The things that we're, you can't see um, from the outside. It's all in the um, wiring, hard wiring of the brain. Right. So neurological disabilities are invisible or they're hidden. So it's things like learning disabilities, um, dyslexia, dysgraphia, um, uh, ADHD, ADD, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, Tourette syndrome, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, anxiety disorder, sensory integration disorder, um, seasonal affective disorder, there's lots of them, but they're all in how you're hardwired in the brain. 
They are internal, but they are impacted by everything external. So they are impacted by your diet, how much sleep you get, the weather, what you're wearing, uh, hormones, stress, so many things outside your body. So these are the kids who you saw them do it. They were really sharp at it one week. They had it, and the next week, not so much. And you're thinking, why is he being so lazy this week? I know he has this. That might not necessarily be so, that he's being lazy. Might be, but if he has a neurological difference, what's happening is that all, those, all the planets were aligned one week that allowed his neurology to work at top notch and be as effective as possible. And so he was really on, he was remembering everything, he was, he was um, you know, working really well with his hands, you know, very adept. And the next week he seems clumsy, forgetting steps, hesitating, and you're wondering what's going on. And that's because something was going on that is impacting neurology to, to be able to work as effectively as it was the, the week before. So characteristics wax and wane. They have it one week, not so much the next, then comes back and is even better. And um, it looks a little bit different. So you might see when they're sitting doing pen and paper tasks, they're stronger than when they're doing hands-on tasks or vice versa. So the context is important in whether or not there's a match between the environment and how their brain works. There's an uneven pervasiveness or path of growth. So if you look at the blue line right through the middle, some folks just progress nice and smooth, a little bit at a time, nice and smooth from point A to point B. Some folks plateau, then take a jump in their abilities, plateau, take a jump, that's the uh, black line. And then the red line is what somebody with a neurological difference might look like. So they make a jump, and then they backslide a little, make a really big jump, backslide a little, and then make the jump again. But if you look, everybody starts and ends at the same place. But for folks whose neurology is impacted so much on what's going on outside them, <clears throat> and their processing is a little bit different on how they go about taking things in from the environment and using them, that they'll go up and down before they get to that end point. But in the same amount of time, they're all getting to the same place. You honestly just have to be patient to see them through the times that they're backsliding a little bit. And they rarely come along. They like to party. So you're not going to have somebody who has one neurological disability and none of the symptoms of any of the other ones. They overlap so much. So somebody with ADHD is almost always going to have anxiety. Somebody with autism is almost always going to have sensory integration issues. Um, so you are... So what I'm going to do is focus more on what the need area is rather than the label. So this is kind of the last slide where I'm talking about any of those disability labels and just thinking about what need areas are. Um, so there's going to be uh, need in their processing. They're going to have some processing issues. Um, difficulty, people with auditory processing issues. They can hear just fine. So it's not uh, a hearing acuity issue. What it is is there's something that happens between the ear and the brain and how they process what they hear. So they have difficulty taking notes. There's some folks who will never, ever be able to listen and take notes at the same time. <coughs> For most of us, listening is an associative or second nature task, and taking notes is a, a, a second nature or associative task. Your brain can do more than one associative thing at a time. So it can listen and take notes. If you have an auditory processing difficulty, listening is a highly cognitive task. And you have to put all of your concentration into just listening. You, and you will not be able to also take notes at the same time. And then if taking notes for you is also a highly cognitive task, there is no way that your brain can do those two things at once. It's like doing a crossword puzzle and uh, calculus at the same time. But if, if you find either of those, if neither of those are second nature to you, if they're both highly cognitive, you're not, your brain's not going to be able to process them at the same time. You have to focus on one and then the other. So that could be true of folks just taking notes because listening is highly cognitive. So these are the folks that you just gave instructions and then somebody raises their hand and says, what were the instructions? And you think, oh really? And you give them again and they still do it wrong. And it is annoying, and it takes time out of the classroom because you have to repeat yourself, and maybe they've already messed something up, so they have to start over. 
They're not doing this to annoy you. They're not doing it on purpose. They're doing it on because their neurology is not letting them process that auditory input in any other way. Uh, visual processing. So folks that read at a very slow pace and they're going to misinterpret what they read. So we often think of dyslexia as um, just switching like B's and P's. We get them mixed up like letters flip back and forth. But it actually is a lot more complex than that. And that's just a small part of what a visual processing disorder might be. Um, whole words can get transcribed in a line. Or trans, um, I can't remember the word is, switched back and forth in a line. So you're reading along and the two words misplace each other. And it can change the entire meaning of a sentence, especially if you're reading something that has a particular sequence and you're listing the steps in order that they have to be. And if your brain actually switches those two words in a sentence, now you are reading them out of order. And you're going to do that sequence out of order. And you really believe you're doing it right according to what you have read. Sometimes lines move when they read, so they split and they move. Some folks with um, significant dyslexia will actually um, report that what it's like to read is to look at the paper while it's going like this. So if you give them something like a test and they have a certain number of a certain amount of time to complete it, and the paper is moving on them, they certainly aren't going to be able to perform the way that you need them to on the test, even though they know what they're doing. Um, and then sensory processing is very common across all of those areas of neurological disability. So these are the folks who are extremely sensitive to sound and light and touch and smell and taste. Um, <coughs> too much so. The brain takes in 800 bits of sensory stimuli per second. All of our brains are doing this right now. 800 bits of sensory stimuli per second. So every color that you see, every object, every shape, every um, sound that's going on. Um, these lights are flickering and they're humming. Um, the, the sound of feet on the floor and objects on the table and people moving in their chairs, they're all creating sounds that we can detect. Um, smells in the room. Uh, the things that we're feeling. Um, you probably aren't paying attention to it right now, but as soon as I say it, you'll be able to feel it. Can you feel your feet in your shoes? Can you feel your butt on the chair? Can you feel your waistband? If you're holding something, can you feel it in your hand? Your pen or the fidget? Something like that. So a couple seconds ago, you were filtering that out, along with hundreds of other sensory bits of sensory stimuli. What the typical brain does is it filters out most of that input, so we only focus on what we need at the, that given time. A person who doesn't have that filter is bombarded with 800 bits of sensory stimuli every second. They are always feeling their feet. Now who can really feel their feet in their shoes and can't get their mind off it? Right, so that's what happens is they can never get their mind off it. So they're trying to listen to you teach, and they're trying to do what they need to do um, in their hands-on learning, they're trying to demonstrate what they know and listen to instructions and they can feel their feet in their shoes and their butt in their chair and they can smell everyone. I've worked with people with very, very over, uh, overstimulated sense of smell. They can smell everyone all the time. That's really, really distracting. It's, it's nice to be able to filter that out. So if we really were that in tune and not so used to filtering out, we would be able to do that. But most of us just say, you know what, don't need that right now, I'm going to set it aside. If you weren't able to set it, set it aside, it's almost impossible to learn in an environment that's overstimulated. So we don't notice that these lights flicker and hum, but for some people it's like trying to learn in a disco. So they can be very overpowering. Um, so also uh, folks with sensory processing issues are ones with large personal space. They have a large personal bubble, and it makes them very, very anxious. Their amygdala does not like it when anybody gets in their personal space. And they fidget a lot, move around a lot, because they truly are uncomfortable in their body and their clothes. Um, so my son's sensory processing issues were mostly um, around food, taste and smell, and um, uh, touch, what he was wearing. <coughs> so um, if anything was too tight or bothersome, it was so distracting that he found it very, very uncomfortable. And his proprioception, which is his 
where his body is in space. The hardest way for him to learn is sitting upright on his butt in a chair. And guess what you have to do for six hours a day in school from kindergarten through 12th grade? Sit upright with your butt in a chair. It was very hard for him to learn. The way he learns best is flat out on his stomach. That's what his body likes. And so they, um, he, it wasn't until fourth grade that he had a teacher that, well, kindergarten is a little bit different because you're moving around and you're up and down. But by first grade, everybody's expected to be either sitting crisscross applesauce all in a row on the rug or in a chair at a desk. And then by fourth grade, pretty much all the time was in a chair at a desk. And so he had a fourth grade teacher and he said, can I do this lying in the reading center? And the teacher said, sure, knock yourself out. And that year, he, his reading levels went way up his writing expression went way up, his math ability went way up, because he was allowed to work on a clipboard laying on his belly in the data center. That's all it took. It was the proprioception. Some kids learn better staying in. Yeah, I'll get to that. All right, um, and then executive functioning different, uh, difficulties are um, pretty pervasive over these areas. And there's two things that our executive functions do for us. Your executive functions are the conductor of your orchestra. So if all of your abilities are like your different instruments that you can play, your executive function is the conductor that tells you when to use those abilities, when to transition to a new ability, when to fade out, and so on. So um, you can, if you can read and write and play an instrument and play sports and um, you are a pastry chef or an auto mechanic or you um, sing in a church choir or any of those things that you're able to do and you do really, really well. Um, those are not impacted by weak executive functions. Those abilities are not. But your ability to plan and organize and transition from one of those abilities might be very deficit. Um, you might have difficulty doing things in any of these areas. So metacognitive skills, thinking about thinking. Um, trouble with goal setting, planning and strategizing, sequencing, organizing materials, time management, task initiation, Goal directed attention, task persistence, working memory, and set shifting. Your working memory is your desktop in your brain. So you know about the long term memory where you store stuff, and your short term memory where you process stuff that's coming in. Your working memory is actually the desktop in your brain where you get stuff out of long term storage, and you've got new information coming in, and you set it all out in front of you so you can work with it. That's your working memory. So some folks have a really large working memory really big desktop. So they can remember tons of stuff and they can have lots of input coming in and they can organize it and they can keep it all straight and they, can, they know where it is in front of them and they can handle it all and they're doing great. Some people have a very, very tiny desktop. So they can only handle so much before something falls off. So if you think about the last time that you had a ton of stuff on your plate, a ton of stuff on your desktop, and you couldn't take any more and something fell off. Something, you dropped the ball on something. What was it? Do we have an example of some kind of particularly stressful time in your life, just a lot going on. Your kids are needy, your parents are needy, your, your car breaks down, you have to go to some professional development thing <laughs> on a Tuesday morning. SLOs. Hmm? SLOs. I, I'm sorry. Forget about the SLOs. What are SLOs? Uh, oh, so, okay, yeah, so get some form, paperwork, something, and your SLOs. Good. Anybody miss a dentist appointment? Something like just completely forgot to go to an appointment or a meeting. Somebody calls you and says, where are you? And you go, just here, forget you. So that's because you maxed out your working memory. Your desktop was maxed out and something fell over the edge. Okay. So imagine if your desktop is tiny, tiny, tiny. That's when you're never going to remember to bring a pencil to class, you're never going to have the right book, you're never going to remember um, the day that you were supposed to show up and do something in class. Uh, that those are the students that appear lazy and or to not care and not have their act together. And really what it is, is their desktop is so tiny and they are managing the best they can trying to balance things on, in that working memory before something falls off. So what we can do, we can't really change the size of somebody's desktop, working memory. Um, what we can do is maximize it, good diet, lots of sleep, um, try to avoid stress, and make better matches in the environment so that our Regal is happy. We'll make the most of the desktop that we have. 
But most of the time, if somebody's desktop is small, what we're going to have to do is provide strategies outside the body. We're going to have to like kind of nail on additions to that desktop. So what wasn't there naturally, we're giving them a little bit more space. So coping strategies to use outside the body so that they can, so they don't have to hold it all internally on that, that original space. Set shifting is um, when you have two different things going on at once. So you've got a weekly assignment due and a monthly project due at the same time. Like when do I work on which one? How much do I do? How do I make sure that both of those things get done by the due date? Um, some classes have something due every day, something at the end of every week, and a big project due at the end of the month. That's a lot of stuff shifting that our brain has to do. Some people can do it no problem. Some people know I can do one of those things and not the other. Right. And they also control our social-emotional regulation. So folks that have trouble with organizing materials, time management, planning things, working memory, most likely also have issues with impulse control, emotional control, meaning that they will have exaggerated emotions, like to hold in their emotions and seem to not be bothered and all of a sudden they'll explode. Because instead of reacting and venting as they go along in appropriate ways, their vent is broken. So it keeps that steam in until the steam engine pretty much explodes. And it seems to be over nothing. But it really was that one thing that finally made them explode. You're like, geez, somebody just bumped into him and went ballistic. What, what is going on? It's not just the bumping into him that made him go ballistic. It's probably three weeks of keeping frustration inside. And all of a sudden, that's the straw. And it exploded. And adaptability, being able to adjust to different situations. So if. This is your processing load in your brain. That's how much everybody gets before you need to sleep for eight hours and have a good meal and whatever. Put your feet up, watch the Netflix. Um, a student with strong executive functions is only going to use up that much of their processing load, organizing, planning, being socially appropriate. A person with difficulties with their executive functions might use up that much of their processing load, being organized, trying to be on time, being socially appropriate. So they've got less than half of their brain space left to learn. It's really exhausting to keep track of that stuff if your executive functions are up to lunch, if your conductor's not there. Um, so some of the social skill differences you might see are folks who interrupt others a lot, um, they dominate the discussion. Um, they talk about irrelevant things. Or you're, they're talking while you're talking, and you're trying to explain something and demonstrate something, and they're talking. They're missing the fact that something else is going on. They're just they're not trying to be rude, but they they're they're lack that social. <coughs> um, lack tact or other social conventions. Would be very inappropriate things which they believe to be appropriate. And a lot of times, what that can come from is. Um, a lot of us pick up most of our social conventions from watching others and figuring out what we should be doing in that given situation. And usually it's a one or two time learning. You see something happen, it has a good impact, you go, oh, that's the way you do it. We learn this from the time we're tiny, one years old, we start picking up on social conventions, what to do. People correct us as we go along, don't do that, get your finger out of your nose, but those kind of things. And we process those along the way and we figure out what's socially acceptable. If you have difficulty with this, then you can't learn by watching. And those reminders that your parents and your grandparents gave you as you were growing up don't sink in quite as fast. So you're watch, you might watch something, and you're trying to pick up on the appropriate thing. So as a person with a social skill deficit witnesses two friends that are best friends. And this kid really wants a best friend. And he sees two other people who are best friends, and they go up to each other, and they're like, hey, hey, ho, how you doing? And they call each other a name because they're best friends, and they do that, and they joke around. And you get to call your best friend something inappropriate because you're best friends, and you grew up calling each other that and whatever. So this person witnesses it, and they're like, oh, that's how you get a best friend. You go up to somebody and call them an a-hole. I get it. And they try that out, and now they're a pariah. And really what they're trying to do is what everybody else does, just way more effectively. Um, they misread body language or facial expressions, so they can't tell when you're bored with what they're talking about or you're getting angry. They just keep going. Um, they're reluctant to contribute in class, so they might be very withdrawn because they've been shot down so many times that they don't think 
they're, they're missing the fact that you told them to put their hand out because it wasn't time to talk, or you told them to stop talking while you're talking, and what they heard was, I don't have anything good to say. Because they're lacking, they don't separate what they have to say from was this the appropriate time to say it. So when you say not now, you're not just saying not now to when they're speaking, they think you're saying not now to everything that they have to offer. So um, they, over time, become very reluctant to contribute to class, take any risks, and those are the ones that just seem very, very withdrawn, and, and, and it's hard to bring them out of their shell. And you know what's in there, the how you come out. They might struggle with speech or have a very flat affect. And I don't know how much it might impact you in your field, but in mine, we actually have a professional disposition that we grade on for enthusiasm. I'm training kindergarten teachers, and it won't do to have a kindergarten teacher that just says, okay, everybody is time to come over to the circle, run for a story. That's not going to work with five-year-olds. So we actually have to have teachers who are enthusiastic and say, come on, everybody, it's time to come over to the circle, run for a story. Does that make you want to be a kindergarten teacher? And let me tie your shoes and wipe your nose while I'm at it. But so then you have to be enthusiastic about all that because that's it really is part of your job and it's an essential skill for you to have. So if I have somebody with a flat affect because they don't regulate their emotions the way that they need to, then do I say that oh, you can't be a teacher then? Or do I say, how do I actually directly teach you to raise your voice, raise and lower your voice with intonation when you speak to little kids. I've done direct intonation lessons with folks and say, every third word, make your voice go up a little, and then you'll be great with kindergartners. And that's how it works. And most, some of us do it second nature. Other folks have to actually learn how to do that. So it can be taught. You just have to figure out different ways to do it. Because it's not happening internally. Okay. So here are some ideas for you, what you want to do for folks. And it's all about making better matches. So figuring out what, how to design stuff so that everybody can hear it, everybody can see it, everybody can reach it, everybody can get to it, everybody can understand it, everybody can use it, and all of the time, everything all together. Not some folks, and then I'll figure out what to do with you, but how do you design so everybody can do it all together? Um, and these are all based on ways to make the amygdala happen. So there's some things that you can't change, and you don't want to change. You don't want to lower the bar. You don't want to change what you're doing, because to lower expectations isn't going to do anybody any good. You have very high standards for your field, and you don't want to compromise on safety. You don't want to compromise on accuracy. You don't want to compromise on creativity. You don't want to compromise on how ideas are communicated. Um, all of that needs to be set at a very high standard. So all of these things that I'm talking about, this isn't saying, oh, you don't have to do that because you don't like it or you're not able to. But saying, you know what, you have to be able to do that just like everybody else or you're not going to make it in this field. But what can I do to make it possible for you to be able to do that like everybody else? So you're not lowering your bar. What you're doing is making sure that everybody starts from roughly the same playing ground. So some folks are starting in a hole. And what you want to do is provide supports for them so they're starting on level ground like everybody else, then they still have to reach the bar. They still, you're leveling the playing field, they still have to play. And they still might not be able to reach the bar. But if you've done what you can to make sure that they can access everything they need and show you what they know, you still want to keep that standard high. It doesn't mean putting anybody through that wants to. It means putting anybody through that wants to that can ultimately meet the standards. It's so important. So there are folks who will still not be able to or choose not to reach that bar when the time comes. Full inclusion, equitable opportunity to succeed, also means equitable, equitable opportunity to fail. If we keep people from not being able to fail or even choosing to quit or fail, then we're not being fair. Everybody else gets to fall short and learn with that, learn from that. So why shouldn't somebody who has a learning difference? So it really is about making better matches, leveling that playing field while keeping that bar high where you want it. So um, some seating alternatives. Now I know you um, do uh, some uh, traditional classroom settings, and then you have a lot of hands-on stuff. So this hopefully should be a mix of both of those. I teach um, 
the same way. I'm teaching while I have folks sitting in front of me in a classroom, and then I'm teaching while we're out in classrooms so and the kids are moving around and actually being up in front of kids. So that's my lab, my shop, my kitchen, whatever it is, is a, is a classroom with little kids in it. So we're doing a lot of things as we go to, and to making sure that they can translate what they're learning in their sit-down classroom to what they're doing out in the field. Um, but anytime that you can relieve stress on the amygdala and make a better match with the environment, everything that they learn from you, they're going to be able to plot in that field or hands-on setting a little bit better. Seating alternatives, that's my guy on the right, my oldest son Sam and one of his really good friends, both of whom work better standing up. So they have classrooms where they have cafe tables and they can actually stand. So if he can't be lying on the floor on his belly, standing up straight is the next best thing. Way better than sitting on his butt in his chair. And actually, there's been studies that show the fewest number of people learn best like this. So why do we do this? Why are there tables and chairs in every learning situation instead of rugs and bean bags and things so we can lay on the floor and stand up? It really dates back to how schools used to be set up. They used to be church buildings, things like that, where the kids sat in pews, and then we, we just kind of kept creating the idea of tables and chairs are really easy for um, custodial staff to clean rather than lots of rugs and pillows and cushions. It all becomes left more convenient and easier and cheaper to fit as many seats in, as possible into a space. So um, if they can sit up, sitting on cushions, it's hard to see in that picture, but they're like semi-inflated seat cushions. If you're sitting on one of those, it, it, you're actually moving a lot while you appear to be sitting still. So it uses a lot of your um, um, excess energy that you have it so you can process more on what's going on. Your body likes to be doing two, thing, two different things at once, or your brain likes for your body to be doing two different things at once. So some people it's enough to listen and, and read the slides. That's enough of a difference that your brain is happy. Some people need a lot more than that. So they need to be moving, they need to be up, they need to be fidgeting with something. Um, so in order for them to process. So the seat cushion is something else for your body to do so that it can also be processing. Um, lighting, um, to get rid of these, you have desk lamps instead, um, or some sort of choice. So one area has desk lamps with the fluorescent lights off, and other areas have them, the overhead lighting. Um, it's hard to meet dichotomous scenes in a classroom without kind of suctioning it off. But some people are going to need those off, and some people are going to need those on. And you know, how do we try to find a way for both folks to be happy? As much as you're able, allow food and drink and chewing gum. Is there anyone who can't allow that in what you do? Food and drink or gum? In a shop or a kitchen? Okay. Know. Could you let somebody, if they needed to, leave for a minute to get a drink and then come back? So different ways to think about it. So your body, this, this is like your base level. Everybody needs food, drink, and some sort of um, sustenance. So I'm probably losing a lot of you already because you're already thinking about lunch, and that's okay. That's your body's natural reaction. I also don't mind yawning and stretching. And most of us try not to do that in front of a speaker because it's impolite to yawn and stretch while somebody's talking. But it actually, your, your brain also needs a snack. And that's exactly what yawning is. It's an oxygen snack for your brain. That's why your body needs to do it. So don't, you don't have to suppress it. You can yawn, you can stretch. And you know, we, we kind of take that as a sign of disrespect from our students that they're not paying attention to us or that they don't think we have anything important to say if they're sitting there yawning while we're talking. It's actually because their brain is trying to keep them paying attention to what you're talking instead of the opposite. So it's, it's about thinking about it a little bit differently. Um, allowing breaks, allowing everybody to stand up every once in a while, do a little, I'm going to do a brain gym thing with me. Everybody gets up out of their seat right where you are. All you have to do is stand up. Do it! Yeah! All right, put your hands out in front of you with your thumbs up. Okay, flip the thumbs down. Cross your hands over each other. Lace your fingers. Pull your hands up toward you. Curl. Now cross one foot over the other. Right. Now I have 
Um, first of all, gotten the blood out of your butt, back up to your brain where it belongs, and have connected both hemispheres of your brain so you are thinking a little bit more clearly. And then you unwind, and sit back down, and that's all it is. It feels good, doesn't it? So, if it's going to be too distracting for you to have kids doing that left and right, you know, individually, then take some time every half hour or so, 20 minutes, to make sure that they do that. And we're all adults. Our brains can take it a little bit longer, um, depending on how much sleep we've had and how interested we are in the topic. But when we have our typical 18 to 22 year old college kids, they are still adolescents. The brain is not adult until the mid 20s. So they are, you are still feeding a growing, changing, developing brain. So they need breaks, even as young adults, 18 to 20 year, 22 year olds, as much as kids need a break. So it isn't until you're, um, actually for, they, they're noticing some differences between males and females, not across the board. Most females fully develop by 25. They're seeing some evidence that male brains develop into their early 30s. So a 30-year-old male with an adolescent brain. Now, the fascinating thing about like, teenagers in high school is their brains are at their most creative ever. Ever. Like 16, 17, 18 years old, we are the most creative that we will ever be. And we are also in the worst in decision making. So we can think up fantastic ideas, but not be able to tell if they're a good idea or not. To actually do. So that's why a lot of teenagers do stupid stuff. And it's a part of their brain figuring out how to be a grown up. Alright, fidgets. That, this, these tangles are so great. I love that that's what the, uh, the giveaway was today because that is exactly what you need to do. If you can offer these something for people to play with, if you don't mind if they, it's a clicking pen to be distracting, tapping pen, front, thumbing fingers. Um, the body will find something to do, tapping your leg, um, nail biting, playing with your jewelry, all these things that you've probably been doing if you don't have one of those fidgets in front of you. The, your body will automatically try to do that. So I have a big box of these that I pass around in every class, and some folks take one, some folks don't, everybody's tried one. And they're different textures, and they're different, um, there's matchbox cars, there's magnets, there's those little flowy things with the glitter in them. Um, and they do different things, but they keep their hands busy, and they actually kind of learn longer with them. They're not distracted by it. Every once in a while, I'll say, check your fidget if I notice somebody's tossing theirs up or making noise with it or something, and they're pretty respectful of each other. How many of you consider yourself really fidgety? Like, you love having something in front of you to play with? How many would find it more distracting? And you'd rather just sit and listen? Okay. That's why you have to have a choice in your classroom. You can, anytime you say never or always, then you're leaving somebody out. So we always have to say, here are fidgets available if you want them. I encourage you to give them a try and see what your brain likes. It might not, but they're always there for everybody. And that's the difference between universally designing and accommodating. So if I accommodate, I might say, you need a fidget, you need large print, you need to take extra breaks, um, you need to chew gum, um, you need uh, extra time on tests. Or I could universally design it and say, you know what, if anybody needs it, I've got large print materials, I've got fidgets, I've got jet gum, and you can have extra time on your test if you want. So every, everything for everybody, that's what uh, universal design is. So some things you can do with your materials too. Um, everything that you post online. Do you have a system that you use here? We use Blackboard at St. John Fisher. There's Chalk and Wire, there's Angel, there's... So if anything that you can post, it's like an electronic cubby. It can't get lost. It's always going to be there. You're not using up that processing load, wondering where materials are. If you don't know that you can always go to that online repository and pick it up. Um, block or chunk materials or assignments. So this is what the executive functions do for us, is if we get an assignment that's done on the 28th, um, we know, okay, I gotta work a little bit toward it so it's done on the 28th. If your brain can't do that internally, something inside says, oh, it's due on the 28th? No more, till the 27th. It doesn't really work that way. 
because what the brain is not able to do in that case is break it down and know that there are several parts to the assignment, each which have to get done incrementally up until the 28th. So you do that once for them to model it. So if you give them a big assignment and it's all described and you say this is due on the 28th, then you have chunk it. This is due on the 25th, work backwards. This is due on the 24th, this is what you should have done by the 18th, and so on, and work back. If you do that once and model it, then you can have your students say, you know, look back to the way that I chunked that last assignment. You need to do it the same way. Let me see what you've done. I'll give you an idea of whether or not you're going to get that project finished in time. That's your guided practice. And then independent practice is say, okay, now you've practiced chunking the assignment. That's what you need to do every time. And actually put it in your planner that way. So not just one big due date in your planner on the 28th, but break it down and you have several small due dates. Colored paper makes the amygdala happy. The harshest, most exhausting thing to read is black print on white paper. Why do we do it that way? There's contrast. State it's bid. the cheapest. Yeah. Colored paper is expensive. It is the cheapest to produce. So everything is black print on white paper in the printing world. But that is the most exhausting for your brain to process. So different brains like different colors. Now my favorite color is blue, but I have found that my brain likes yellow. So if I'm reading on yellow paper, either print it on yellow paper, or I take a sheet of yellow acetate and put it over a page in the book, one page at a time as I'm reading, I can read much longer with a lot more retention than if I read black and white. So you're going to try it out a little and see. So if you can print your handouts on <coughs> colored paper, or um, if you post things electronically, folks can change them to the, to the background color that they like. They can read longer and they retain it better, believe it or not. It's a very tiny, like none of this is rocket surgery. And you know, the, the simple things, it's just knowing how the brain likes to process them. Using graphic organizers like these, that's one of those other ways to present information that forms a neural network. So if you write it in text and in a list, and then plug it in, to a Venn diagram, so, so it's a representation. Is it a flow chart? Is it a web? So here's your main topic, and then these are some subtopics that go off of it. Um, is it relational? So these are three separate things, but they, these are the, what they have in common. That's when we use a Venn diagram. Um, Smart Art on Microsoft Word has a million of them. So you can find one that represents what information you need. So if they see it in a regular text, and they see it in a graphic organizer, and you talk them through it, and you let them talk to a friend about it, then you've created a really strong neural network all around that same material. Um, this is for a little more hands-on, things that they're maybe not able to keep straight. Um, if you are referring to something, safety procedures, anything that has to happen in a certain sequence, can you also post it, rather than just saying it out loud? So if they are working with machinery and some that hands-on tools and things, they might not always be able to have something like a reference sheet with them, a cheat sheet with them, or a packet or anything. Um, but could it be posted somewhere in the room or displayed so you have a projector right on the wall or something so that they can see the steps? Because the less they have to hold in their brain, the more safe and capable they're going to be with their hands if they have something that they can refer to. Um, I use desk maps. Um, I've used them more with um, younger kids. I'm using them a little bit in college if I need to know that that's a need that I have to address. But it's basically, actually, I think I put one up here. There. So this is one that I, you know, it's something that you, you post, and I've got Velcro with different things. So if I want desks clear except for the notebook, you just put the notebook up there. Because you know there's kids that you say everything off your desk except for a pencil. And two minutes later, you have to say it again because somebody still has something out on their desk except a pencil. And then you have to say it again because somebody put everything away, even their pencil. And so now you keep repeating yourself. You're still waiting to start. Not everybody's ready. But this is because this is not happening in their brain. They're not visualizing what you're telling them. And they keep forgetting what it is that you need them to do because they're thinking about other stuff. So um, if you say, just your pencil out, and you put that on the map, and you keep it up there, and then they can just know that they can refer to that and see what they're supposed to have out. Some people's might, if you're thinking, that's silly, why can't they do it? It's because your brain does it. And it's hard to put yourself in the shoes of somebody whose brain doesn't do that. Um, so that's a desk map. 
sequence labels, if they have to use tools in a certain sequence, can you label them so that you know that they have to do this, then that? I've had to do that on, um, I use a smart board. A lot of my students teach lessons on the smart board and um, the interactive whiteboard. And if you do one thing before another, you'll open up the wrong program or it won't do what you need to do. You need to click this before you highlight the text if you want to change it from the handwriting to whatever. And so a lot of them get it out of order and it just takes longer. So I actually have things numbered on the smart board label. One, then two. One, then two. And then finally it becomes ingrained. Maybe more repetition than other people. But it's, that's not happening in their head, so it has to be outside their head for a little bit. Um, coding their materials and tools. Now, Color coding doesn't always work, and this is I kind of found out the hard way when my son was trying to keep track of his materials. I got him a red notebook and a red folder, and I covered his math book in red wrapping paper, and I said, okay, everything that has to do with math is red. And he said, how do you expect me to remember that? And I thought, that seems so simple and easy, but that's how my brain works, and his doesn't. It was a highly cognitive task for him to remember all of that. So color coding could be fantastic for some people and actually much more confusing for other people. So I haven't really figured out how that, why that works, but that seems to be the truth. Um, scribe pens. Has anybody seen a scribe pen that takes while you're taking notes with it? It records, so you don't have to write down every note. You could just write in like an asterisk and a word, and then the pen is recording what you're saying. And then later when you go back and you, it's a special paper too, and you write over the asterisks and the word that you wrote, the pen plays back what was said at that time. So you don't have to write down everything that was being said, just one word of it. So if taking notes is difficult because you don't have to really have to write down. Self-amplifiers for self-talk. They make really expensive ones. You can buy them on the market. Some people just like to talk into a little PVC tubing and they might just have to say it out loud to them. So even in testing situations, they might have to read the test out loud to do really well, but if you have a self-amplifier, and no one else can hear them at all, but they can hear themselves really, really well as if they're talking out loud. So some folks just need to say it to get it. Um, the best <coughs> math. Templates, uh, graphic organizers, tools, supplies, steps, other notes, seeing it in a different way might make it easier to remember. Um, oops. That's a customized planner I made uh, for students so that they had everything that they needed to do in order that they needed to do it. And it's actually a little metal thing with a spring in it, so if the pen is missing, it won't stay together. So it's almost a reminder that you're missing something right built in. But it also, it leaves room to schedule in travel time, set up, and clean up. Because that's not obvious for some people to be able to do that. So just like you would break down an assignment with the due dates, some people when they're scheduling time need to break it down. And they schedule an appointment for 3 o'clock and an appointment for 4 o'clock and forget that it's a 20 minute walk between the two. So they're 20 minutes late for the 4 o'clock. Because they think, oh, 4 o'clock appointment, I'll go at 4, but then it's a 20 minute walk. So those are the, the people who are always late for things. Um, they are not thinking about the travel time. Scheduling time for email, meals, and downtime actually has to happen too, so that you're not, so that you are giving your brain a break and you're making sure you're nourished the way that you need to be. Um, a lot of choice in how assignments are submitted or completed, so different formats. Can they do a poster instead of a paper? Can they talk you through something um, versus write it? Um, you already have built right into your program showing you not always writing it down. So that's something that's already innate in your programs. It's extremely helpful. Um, avoid set switching or when you do have to set switch, so your weekly assignment and a monthly assignment, give them some hints as to what they might work on each night. Um, using templates, can they hand in stuff and in, in, hand things in your graphic organizers the same way that you maybe presented information to them in graphic organizers? Um, extended time on tests, they don't have to have documented accommodations to allow extended time on tests. If you're willing and able to do that, what they, what some studies have found that, say you had an hour for the test, and you told folks, you know what, um, take as much time as you need. You can stay later, I'll be here for an extra hour, so you can take up to two hours. What they find is that folks who 
got extended time who normally would take more than an hour, once they know they have plenty of time, would actually take less than the hour to complete it. Because the stress that's relieved by knowing there's not a time limit actually helps them work more efficiently. So they can complete more things better in less time if they know they have plenty of time. And you have to kind of blend that with how important is the time limit? So th some things you have to be quick and fast. I don't want my trauma surgeon to think he has all the time in the world, uh, or an EMT. Some things you have to be fast. Me as a professor, <coughs> teacher, educator, I don't have to do anything fast. I don't have to do anything right the first time. I get redos all the time, and I can think through things. When students ask me questions and I don't know the answer, I can say, you know what, I'm going to need to think about that because I don't have it right on the top of my head, but I'll get back to you tomorrow. So I have to work like this all the time. So, um, and I think that is the case for most of us um, in a lot of what we do in our fields. Um, it's, you can't see that up there, but adapted tests, uh, block things out, put highlighted box, um, multiple choice. Give three answers, and three choices instead of four. It's the same thing. There's no reason why we always have four, uh, but there's always an A, B, C, and D. And I think it's just long-standing convention, but there's no reason or no research that says that four is more important than three, or better or worse than three. Um, they're still doing the same thing. They're still analyzing answers for which one is the best, choosing the best one. They still have to have the knowledge that it takes to answer that question, but you've just relieved 25% of their reading processing load. So if you have a multiple choice, have A, B, and C instead of A, B, C, and D. Um, or mark a test. If you, if you type up the test, if you write it up yourself, put the ones that you want them to do first when they're fresh in the beginning of the test, the ones that are most important, and then leave the ones where they can probably do better even if they're getting a little bit tired toward the end of the test. If the test is already written for you, then mark it. Start one, I want you to do this question first. Highlight it. This is the... This is where you need to be most fresh. I'm an advocate to move backwards just a little bit in your, your time, uh, extended time. That's right. Just having no time. However, I ran into an interesting situation, and maybe you can offer some front-loaded uh -huh. advice. Uh, you know, a student that has extended time uh, didn't utilize time parameters for tests, but you know, on a 30-question test in four and a half hours, I said, dude, uh, we got to call this thing. Um, and what he was doing was actually redoing the test. He had completed it, but he kept going over and redoing it with the hopes that more information would come. And this was a consistent thing I realized after 15 weeks. That's how he was utilizing his extended time. Um, it was just to redo it over and over. Rather than needing that time to process it. Exactly. So what are some tools or some tactics to communicate with someone like that to advise them that's not what this is designed for. That's, that's not to use the to not use that whole time just when the test is already done. <coughs> yeah, and I guess it's a, it's an opportunity to teach or learn. For example, we mm -hmm. teach in the National Effort Code. It's a book about that fit. Ideally, you can have all the time in the world, but you can't sit there page by page and look for the answer. And right. we, we teach our students that you know, that's not a realistic approach to problem solving or to share information with us. But what I've come to realize is that that's almost what the student was doing was over the course of reviewing over yeah. and over, his hope was something would pop up and come to him. And Which it's very persistent. could be true, and maybe that happened one time and so they realized. That was their success. And some people do that because they give you a tool that later questions will give you a clue to the answer to an earlier question. So that might have been a taught skill that he's bringing up from high school or something to just keep going through and through and use all your time. Right. Some folks, you know, have tell their students, use all your time, you get it, use the whole kind of thing. So there might be some habits that he's using that he's taught that maybe not are not he's not using it for their peak effectiveness, but there's some habits that I heard. Um, one thing I could you might show is you know, even just give him something um, to show him the difference. So give him the test. It's not going to count for anything or anything. You just take this test and he finishes and he go, finishes and he goes through in whatever time it takes him. And he's completed it. And then um, grade it, you know, have feedback for it. 
whether you mark it or not, and then say, okay, now if you were going to go use your extra time to go through it and go through it like you usually do, and then two hours later you look at it again, you can show them the difference between a 90 and a 91. Or maybe it even went down, because a lot of times when we go back and correct things, we're counting, you know, we're working against ourselves and we change something that was originally correct to an incorrect answer because we overthink it. Uh, to show them, look, in all that time that you kept reprocessing all this, you actually, your grade went down. So it might seem that end product and the difference between just going through it once and trusting your instincts will help you break that habit a little bit. And the other thing I was thinking of too is, um, lost the thought, that you, there's something you said that kind of got me off in a different direction about having them, um, um, oh, the idea that you know we give ex like time and a half or double time to kids, and sometimes it's a stamina issue, and that they are completely tapped out after an hour, so giving them two hours is not going to help. So thinking about breaking a test in half and doing two sittings instead of two hours, and so he only gets half of the test for half of the time, and so there's only so much he can go through that might help, and then he gets a second half in another sitting and goes through, and that might kind of break that habit a little bit. So a place to start. Anyway, and then we're coming I'm going to keep thinking on that too. Um, if you let folks know a couple of the questions that are going to be on the test before the test comes, they still have to find the answers themselves, and they still have to be able to give you the answers or a couple of hints for something that they have to demonstrate to you. Excuse me. <coughs> Um, you will alleviate a ton of stress so that they will be able to perform better on the test as a whole. And all you're doing is giving them one or two questions to expect. Maybe three at the moment, because there's going to be a ton of questions. And then they'll be able to do those and all of the rest of them so much better. Because they just need a little bit of that anxiety relief before the test comes up. Whenever you're doing projects, giving them some sort of visual, so instead of just a checklist, um, or a rubric, actually show how much of the project is being graded. So this one was based on a paper that my students had to write. So uh, I had some folks who assumed, okay, the paper has five parts, the cover page, the intro, the body, the conclusion, and the bibliography. And they're thinking in their heads, five parts, due in five days, I'll do the cover page tonight, I'll do the intro on Tuesday, I'll do the whole body on Wednesday. And so they're thinking that the five parts are going to be equal amount of time and effort, and that's not the way. So if you display it in a pie chart like that, they can see that the body of the paper is actually a third of the work. That's going to take three days, where the, the cover page is just going to take a few minutes. So that's actually just a sliver of the work. So this is another thing that our executive functions do for us. So if that's not happening internally, it has to happen externally. And then a growth mindset. So this is, you know, have doing some sort of progress monitoring. This is how far you've come in mastering this. So if they do something and fall on their face, or they can't quite finish it, they can do 80% and then they just don't know how to finish the task, then you, to be able to show them, but look, you've got the first 60 or 70 or 80% right. You have mastered that. So instead of saying you can't do this, say you can't do this all yet. And that really um, changes over their mindset. And providing incremental feedback along the way. The brain likes incremental feedback. That's why video games are so popular. When you play a video game and you master a level, you don't get a gold star, you don't get a grade, candy doesn't come shooting out, nobody comes and has a ticker tape parade for you. What do you get if you master a level on a video game? You get the harder level. You get a new challenge without any prize. So that's why they're so popular, because they work with how the brain works. The brain likes a challenge that's engaging. They know what they're supposed to do. They know how they're supposed to do it. They know why they're doing it. And when they complete something, they get a new challenge that's even more engaging. So if we can focus on the way we teach around that, the better. This is a, this is, um, a strategy for um, if they're writing something or doing a project, if they get, um, you, have, you break it up into parts. This was based on a written project, but you can do it with pretty much everything else. Like, so maybe the first part is getting all the materials you need together. And then being able to explain all the steps that you're going to follow. And then being able to follow those steps. And then being able to present the finished product. If you separate all those things out, and maybe they can get all the materials together and they can explain the steps, 
and then they can get go through most of the steps so that they get they just have a hard time finishing up and presenting it then instead of getting a zero because they couldn't get all the way to the end they get a 70 because they get 20 points for getting all the materials together 20 points for being able to explain the steps 20 to 30 points to be able to get them through most of the steps. Then they see that their effort was worth something, they're going to be much more likely to go back and try it again rather than just quit. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot of ground rules um, in my classroom about so how everybody can work effectively kind of things. Um, code words for discussion, though that's that like catch in your brain that tells you what's appropriate and what's not. If you don't have that, it might have to be on the outside. Uh, so the whole thing, check your fidget. Um, I also say share the wealth a lot when somebody's hogging the conversation because I want them to know that what they say is a wealth, but that it's time for somebody else to have a shot to. Um, there's some students where, you know, if they talk a lot or blurt out things a lot, I say write it on a post-it instead and give it to me later, and then I'll respond to it by email after class or something, but I, you know, I can't keep stopping class every time you have a thought. And a lot of it is bringing awareness to the fact that they do it um, helps a lot. Um, so what we want to be thinking about is, for what we teach, what are the absolute essential things that we have to have them have? Absolutely essential, that you cannot give on. So to be a sign language interpreter, you have to be able to hear. To be a teacher, you have to be able to communicate. Um, what do you have? Well, this this is just a question. Uh, <coughs> you said earlier that um, to put text on a different color background paper. Yep. Um, the area my students are getting into, they're going to have to do service information. And I've never seen. They're going to have to what? Sorry. They're going to have to read service information. Okay. And I've never seen service information that has been on a different color. It's always been white and black letter. I don't think that's going to change. How are they going to be able to transition to that? If, if, if they're used to seeing text on their colored paper, and all of a sudden they get a job, and everything's on white paper, how are they going to? To the question. Um, this is another, that anything that you're doing in your class is to help them learn along the way. So once they've mastered it, that becomes a lot easier for them to transition to another thing. And another way you can do it is wean it off. So as they learn the material and they're more familiar with it and they're not soaking it up for the very first time, then having that on white paper. So things that were our review. So, but it's not, if they see it on blue paper, they're not gonna, they're not gonna forget that you know, in the future they're gonna see things on white paper. It's just that reading things on white paper is gonna be, they won't be able to do that for a very, very long time without exhausting. So, but the more you know the material, the easier you go through it anyway. So it's most important to do that the very first time they're reading through it. So if they have textbook pages and textbook pages to read through as they're learning the material the first time, it, it, it's going to drain their brain a lot less to read it on colored paper. It doesn't mean they can't read on white paper. It's just going to take a little more processing for them. But by the time they get out there and they have that <coughs> choice, they're going to know it. It's going to be more second nature to them. Maybe not all of it, but a big chunk of it, so that it'll make it easier. But if you're concerned about that, then think about it when you're presenting to them and say, you know, that, you know, if you have a lot to read that's new to you, read it on colored paper or, you know, like change the color in the background. But also, you know, see what your brain does when you're reading on white paper. And they're doing that all the time. They're not doing, you know, they're doing it in all areas of life at the same time. So it's just a nice slide. You wouldn't recommend white background for that either? Um, sometimes. I mean, I usually soften it up and it's not. It's usually a green or blue instead of a black. But yeah, something like that. That's a little bit easier because it's less text. But it's just the idea of page, where page after page after page of black and white is tiring on the brain much more so. What are your thoughts on uh, texting uh, what some pages are not yet? Uh -huh. Two different things. Um, if the, hearing it auditorily is going to help them process it, 
then by all means, uh, I'm for it. At the same time, they should also be reading along or keep reading things. Some people, their dyslexia is so significant, they will never be able to read text. So for them, you would know if they aren't being able to pull text up off the page and understand it. Um, that's something that would be definitely documented and they would have accommodations for. They always get materials on tape. If it's somebody who can read but prefers to hear it, then both all the time. Because they should get that information through their preferred modality hearing because it will help them understand the content. But they should also be reading as much as they can to, to maintain and build that skill at the same time. Now, do you know if your students have a particular disability? We are I don't always know. So we, we don't know if they have. Right. We might know there's something we don't know. Why. Sounds right. If they are documented and they're taking accommodations, they will have brought you paperwork to sign that says, I'm aware of the, the accommodations that you get. Some folks don't disclose. Some folks have disclosed with the college and have documented accommodations and never <coughs> approached their instructors to take them. Um, and I have a lot of folks who just don't disclose. And that's their option. To, to not to choose not to disclose their disability and take their accommodations. In that reign, you are you are just doing your best to make your environment a match for everybody who's in front of you and trying to make sure that you um, you are keeping track of who's accessing and who's having trouble and trying different things for, for folks who might be struggling. But at some point you're not gonna you don't have to keep trying and keep trying and keep trying until everybody gets an A. That's not what about this what this is about here. You're, you're going to do different things so you are pretty sure that everybody is accessing everything and then it's up to them. So they still might not make the bar. So are some of these um, different ways of being, are they, do they present themselves in a spectrum? Yes. You're either very much or you're just kind of like this? Yes. Absolutely. So that's we all why, do. That's why people don't disclose or don't get diagnosis, but may still have a need. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that's kind of, that's where the law comes into. There's a law for disability classification. You have to have that disability to the extent that you can't function without special help. And then there's the um, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act that you're, it's not so significant that you can't function, but you still it does impact your daily living. Um, so my daughter has a hearing impairment not significant enough for her to get a classification for hearing impairment or deafness, but it's kind of, uh, she, she falls under Section 504, that it does impact her hearing in the classroom, so she can't auditorily access everything that everybody else has, accesses, so she gets uh, hearing aids and an FM amplifier in school. So she actually doesn't fall under the disability law, she falls under the, um, the um, daily impacting condition law. So it's a different realm. So that right there the law is recognizing that there's a range. But we all have it. I mean, fist to, fist to five, um, tell me how strong you think your executive functions are. I am on top of things all the time. My working memory is, my desktop is gigantic. I never drop anything. I'm organized. Everybody tells me I'm so organized. I waffle between a four and a five. I am very strong executive. I am a planner. I am organized. Uh, I'm where I need to be all the time. Uh, what about if there, I'm guys? For something, it kills me because I get really afraid that I'm losing it. There. Down to a fist. Or you would forget your hat if it wasn't screwed on so tight. Right. How about social skills? I am the savviest person. I get along with everybody. I read a room. I am fantastic at my social skills. All the way to, I have been jailed because I've been inappropriate to a cop. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, right. so everybody has a scale. All right. How about math? This to five, math skills. Uh, writing. This to five and writing. So you didn't have the same number of fingers up for those most of the time, and you didn't have the same combination as the person next to you. We're all on a range, and we all have our own unit. We're all a different animal that's sitting in, you know, in that cartoon. All right, so you've got your essential things that cannot give, and you all know what they are about your field. And then there's important things, too, that have to happen in your field. And then there's stuff that's just nice, not important or essential. You can let the nice go. Most of what's nice has become a convention in our field and is really not necessary anymore. Like sitting in a chair to learn, maybe that's just nice. 
because it keeps everybody at the same level and I get to be higher. Talk above you all. I don't know why that's important. Could is it, would it be okay for folks to be standing along the back? They're not blocking a view, but they're learning better standing up. How their you know how how their bodies are where they're learning might just be something nice and you forget about that so much. How their stuff, how their projects come into you. I work with people who not only require things come in in hard copy, but in a certain color report cover with the staple just so like flush with the paper, not at a diagonal, like things like that. And for students to have to keep track of that, now they're thinking more about that than they're thinking of actually what goes on the paper. Have you ever gotten anything torn out of a spiral notebook with the fringes on the side, uh, written so that the margin and the holes are on the right? <laughs> and you're thinking, really? But who cares? Just look at what's on the paper. That's what's more important. And I know it's annoying that the fringes are on both sides and the holes are on the right. You can't stack them up nice and somebody's got that slip report cover and they just slide off your desk or you know, something. But that's, that's the stuff that's nice. You can let it go. So for me, what's essential is that they have to know children's developmental levels. And they have to know how to get contact with products of different learners. I will not bend on that. They have to be fully inclusive of every culture and ability in their classrooms. I will not bend on that. That is essential. For them to be a teacher. It's important for them to know lots of different ways to teach social studies, to have a backup ways to explain math, for them to have really creative anticipatory sets to, to grab their kids' attention right away. That's important. It's just nice if they fill out their lesson all in the same format because it makes it a little bit quicker for me to read through. But I could forget that. They can hand in a lesson plan anywhere. They can read it out on toilet paper for all I care, as long as I get their thoughts down on paper. So it's taken me a while, but I, every year I let go of something else that was just nice. And I've supported more. That's important and essential. And so we're putting out teachers who are very diverse learners, teachers with disabilities, and who are fantastic role models and are unbelievable critical thinkers and problem solvers. And that's what inclusion does for everybody. That's what the research shows. That if you work in an inclusive setting with people who are not quite like you, but you see them coming up with plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, figuring it out out of the box and being creative, you will become a better critical thinker and problem solver too. So that's a lot of the research. So rethinking what responsibility, independence, and success is and how we can, su how we can support students rather than come up with all of these barriers that we put in front of them that might hurt them from going into the field that they want to go to. And thinking about, you know, doing all of this, these different things for folks. Are we providing an unfair advantage for some, or just are we removing an unfair disadvantage that they used to have? So if you provide all of this stuff for everybody, and everybody has the same opportunity to try out these different ways of doing stuff, then you're being fair much more fair than, than the opposite. So, there's some references at the end. And that's my email. We've got it on the last slide. If any of your individual questions, you know, um, touch base with me. If you have a specific student you're thinking about and something they're struggling with and you need some ideas, please email me and ask if they, and maybe I can come up with something very specific that might help them. Thank you for your attention. It's been a long time in a very good audience. Yes. Um, a lot of our lab work here is done collaboratively. And so, as an instructor, obviously there's a lot of control in the classroom regarding a lot of the things that you do. But it's done collaboratively with students working with other students. So, I imagine that's a fairly exhausted topic, but what suggestions would you have for trying to create that environment, not just from what we direct, but from them coming to the public in terms of... Relying on each other and making everybody accountable? Right. I run into this all the time. And our program has a lot of group work because co-teaching is very effective. We are, we are preparing our teachers to be co-teachers because that's the cutting edge of, of, of the practice right now. So we have to make sure that they can co-plan and co-teach, co-assess, and work together on everything, all the decision-making together. We also have to make sure they can do it individually. 
So um, we have a lot of both uh, individual projects, but a lot of group work. And uh, sometimes I let them choose their groups, which can be helpful because it relieves stress, especially in the beginning. But as they increase in their program, I assign groups. And I will purposely get to the point when they are seniors and ready to go out and student teach and assign them in groups with people I know they prefer not to work with. And it is a challenge. So we've got that whole range from I got to pick my best friend and roommate all the way up to I've got to work with her. And so, and they have to be able to do that before I will put them out on the field to teach kids because they're not always going to get paired with somebody that they like and, and think like, but they have to be able to cooperate and collaborate. So I share that with them right off the bat. That's the first thing, is to say you have to be able to work with people that you might not choose to work with. That is an essential skill in your field, and we are going to scaffold ways for you to be able to do that. And one of the scaffolds is assigning group roles. So everybody's pretty clear on what they're supposed to do, what their job is, what somebody else's job is, and then you rotate them to make sure that everybody can fulfill each of their roles. So if there's parts of a project that you can separate nicely and each person can do a piece and then you bring it together um, at the end, that works well. Um, I do things like I'll have a planner who puts out the schedule for the project, somebody who's in charge of um, you know, like gathering the resources, somebody who's in charge of writing it up, somebody else who's in charge of you know, the mini media, whatever pieces of the project that you have, describe the role and assign somebody to the role. And then they evaluate themselves and their teammates in that role. So I have, and if you email me, I can send it to you, um, group evaluation sheets that I do. What was your role, um, and how well did you fulfill all these pieces of your role, why did you rate yourself that way? And it's part of, that's an assessment that they have to turn in at the end. And then they get to do, and your group mates, what were your group mates' roles, and how well do you think they can fit? Because it's also important for them to be able to, if they're ever going to be managers or leaders, be able to provide constructive feedback. And so that's a skill they have to gain too. So this is all in, uh, you know, in the, the, the idea of teaching them all those essential skills they have to have as a professional, the same time preparing them to work with each other. And you know, they, we get to grade as part of our standards, we get to grade on how well they work together. And if they have a problem, I never ever let them come to my office and talk about their roommates. I will talk to them alone on do you need help learning skills to approach your roommates to talk this problem out with them. But if they come to my office and say, all right, I've got a problem. This one member of our group, I say, stop them. Get them all in here, the whole group, and we'll talk about the role definition again, and who needs to be working on what, and how we can get a, you know, a support plan so that we can get all back up to speed. But I won't let them talk about each other or complain about who's working and who's not working. Um, but I'll say, I can give you skills to talk to them about how you are frustrated with them not pulling their weight or whatever. And so we've worked through that too. But those, those are just a few of the things that I do to make sure that they can effectively work in groups. And it is very much a learned skill for a lot of people. We don't start out knowing how to do all those things. And there's a lot involved. Communication, knowing your own working style, knowing your own abilities, those of others. So there, there's a lot of sub skills in there. So it takes a lot of scaffolding. What did you do This is your job. This is my job. And I'm not going to do things that are a student's job, and neither are you. And so that kind of, sometimes the support plan is for the parents. <laughs> and to say, this is no longer your job. Your job is, you know, you've moved from somebody who's hands-on to somebody who's, you know, pretty much a cheerleader in the background. And, and, and sometimes the parents need scaffolding. And it's, you know, it, and it's a cultural thing. And so we have to respect the cultures that they come from. And I've also had the flip side where students have um, need more support at their home base. But it's a very hands-off, and you're an adult now, sink or swim, 
but they really do still need a you know, support base at home where, so it's, it's not always that parents are too helicoptery. Snowplow parents was the new term I've heard. You've heard the helicopter parents where they're hovering waiting to come in and help if something goes wrong. Snowplow parents get rid of the problems before they even touch their kids. So we, you know, we have a culture where we've crept from helicopter parents to snowplow parents. We have deprived an entire generation of kids from being able to, to have the great experience of falling flat on their face and knowing how to get up and dust themselves off. Failure or making a mistake is a really great thing. So that's one of the things that your student's job is to make a mistake every once in a while and figure out what their plan B is. And you as a parent is to let that happen and that can be the hardest thing. But if they do need, you know, you can share things with parents to say, this is what you can do on your end, and this is how I would, you know, this is how far I will go, <coughs> excuse me, to support the student, but then I'm going to stop here, because I need to know he or she can reach that bar. Could you please tell us again how you read um, with the colored, you, when you have to me? TV, you said you used some kind of... Remember the overheads? Of old, the yeah. overhead projectors yeah. with the clear sheets, they come in colors. You can, they, you can still find them, believe it or not, at Staples or uh, uh, Office Max. The acetate, it's a sheet of acetate. Okay. It's just a clear see-through page, and then I can slide it on. So, so somebody <coughs> could develop that as a personal habit if it helps them? Yeah, absolutely. If they just have it, they know that it helps them. They can always just have it there okay. to put it. They also make on the market, they look like rulers but they don't have numbers on them, they're just plastic, and you can, um, it's much more portable, and it's the hard plastic, so it's not gonna get all crinkled up. Something, you know, like somebody always has a pen in their pocket, they could always have a colored plastic bar in their pocket, and you just run it down <coughs> when you're reading. Some people use a magnifying glass when they're reading. Your readers, if you have readers for reading, that's the same idea. Always have it with you, you can put the plastic right on the readers. I just want to get right now. <laughs> rose color looking, going through life with rose colored glasses. So yeah, so whatever works for you, knowing that you need it. And the other part is being able to explain to other people why they need it. So if somebody, you know, if you, somebody, I have a student who always has to be chewing gum to deal with her anxiety. Something about chewing relieves her anxiety. She has a significant anxiety disorder. And if she is not chewing gum, her anxiety goes through the roof. So if she knows she's going into a classroom that, where the, the teacher does not allow gum, then she's really anxious before she walks in the door. And she has to deal with it in some way, shape, or form, but she does much worse in those classes than in others. So she is learning how to be able to say, I chew gum, not because I'm being disrespectful, or, you know, but because it relieves the anxiety that I have. So you have to be comfortable talking about it. So we have to remove some of the stigma that's attached to having an anxiety disorder or any other type of learning difference. It's being able to say, you know, it's, it's diversity. It's not a deficit. I'm no less of a learner because of it. I just know what I need to have um, to be able to do it. Well, yeah, it, it happens. But, you know, and it's a pattern. Yeah. It's a pattern and just to say, oh, I need that extra time and I need you to give me more time on this project and things like that. And you want to be that. Mm -hmm. And they're choosing to do that too. I do a model guided practice independent practice thing a lot. So I'll say, okay, you didn't finish this project in time. I will, I will give you extra time this time. And I'm going to show you how to better, um, you know, meet out your time in the future. And so when the next project comes along, I'm going to say, remember how I showed you to do that? How are you going to do it for the second project? And they'll say, okay, these are all the you know, sub-due dates that I put down in my plan. And I'll say, okay, good, there's no reason that you would need that time then. And so if they don't have it done that time, then, no, we talked through this. You had the support that you needed to show me that it was there. And then, you know, usually that second time where you helped them through it, it works well. And then in the future you say, you need to do that. So it's kind of that three strikes throughout, one and a half strikes, you know, where. So the first time I'll actually say, okay, this time, and we're going to work on the support so that next time you don't need that from me. And it's, so it's giving them the, the benefit of the doubt at least once helps you kind of figure out if it's a bamboozle or not and if they keep coming back. And those folks are there and, you know, and a lot of it is experience too in figuring out if they really need it. 
just kind of pulling over. And you can tell, don't you feel like you can tell a lot of the time for the students who are coming to you with the explanations of this really? I've had students come to me and I'm like, okay, you can't make that up. You know, like things they come and they're like, I locked my car, my keys in my car, and my coat was in it, and so and they come into class and they're like soaking wet, and they're like, my coat is locked and it's dragging on the ground and it's in the parking lot, and my backpack's in there, and also I fell and hit my head, and they're, and they're just like, okay, just go. And, you know, and the other ones come to you and, you know, their grandmother has died again, and, you know, so you, you can get, and, you know, I, bringing awareness to it, and so, you know, about the excuse making. As a skill, I think they have to get too. Anything else, please, really feel free to email me. Anything comes up immediately, months from now, um, just remind me who you are and where you're from, and uh, if I can help come up with any specific strategies for students that you have, I'd be happy to do so. And lunch is there, so I will not keep it. <laughs>